My name is Peter Robbins, I'm a professor here at Texas Tech, also part of the lecture committee, and I'm uh, very happy to introduce Douglas Stockman, uh, who's down from Kansas City, who is today, and uh, we'll find out tomorrow that he's going to talk a little bit about their work. Um, one couple things that I've written down, I have a very long intro, but I'll probably shorten it a little bit. Uh, Douglas Stockman is a founding partner at El Dorado Inc. His work has been published numerous times in Archival Record, Archival Magazine, Azure, Daily, of course dwell and several other regional and national publications. Uh, the firm has been recognized for their design excellence by being named for the Archival League of New York's Virgin Voices in 2008, as well as being recognized for design excellence in several regional and national awards, including the Kansas City AIA, Central States AIA Awards, and several other awards. A couple of things that uh, kind of stick out for me uh, with, with their work. Um, one is kind of the multi-scalar approach. They, they do anything from kind of single-family homes and small-scale residents, uh, as well as public parks, installations, all the way up to kind of larger-scale mixed-use projects, which can be uh, combined residential with other things, or even civic and institutional and uh, commercial projects. So if you go to the website, there's a very large um, range of scales and kind of, uh, kind of really speaks to the entire spectrum of, of architecture. A second thing is the fabrication. Uh, they, I say, correct me if I'm wrong, but they, they do, they actually have fabrication studios within their architecture firm. So in addition to designing and, uh, and uh, fabricating, they actually have uh, design build is, is one of the aspects of their, of their practice. So in addition to the kind of traditional architecture, they also offer um, fabrication and uh, architect-led design build uh, projects, which if you don't know what design build is, it's essentially a streamlined process where they're taking something from a sketch, kind of the, kind of the initial schematic of a project, all the way through architecture design and to the, the, the building of that project. So I think that's kind of interesting and it's kind of unique for uh, El Dorado. And the third thing is that they're actually very interested and very involved in teaching. Um, if you go to the website, there's actually I'm not sure if it's a every year or every uh, semester, but it seems like about once a year they're actually uh, teaching studio and actually being uh, interacting with students and either design build projects at different schools like Kansas, uh, Kansas State or Kansas, University of Kansas. They also have projects with uh, Tulane and uh, Lawrence Tech and uh, Washington University. We um, went back seven or eight years. So, uh, in, in closing, uh, before I introduce, I think. One thing you'll probably hopefully notice is the, the series of beautifully, I think beautifully detailed projects, uh, which really speak, really speaks to their knowledge of not only how to design spaces and how to design projects, but also the fabrication and how to make things. And I think that's fairly, fairly evident in their work. Um, also, the, uh, there's, a, there's one quote on their website for the uh, So beyond the detail, they also, this is the quote, see the buildings, See the buildings we design as collaborators at a larger scale, as active contributors to a vibrant public realm. And I think that's actually something that we all strive to, to do as architects and as designers. Is, uh, how does our architecture engage? Architecture engage not only as a, a building in a small scale, but also engage the environment and community. So please welcome, a warm welcome to Douglas Stockman. Um, thank you for having me down. I really appreciate it. Um, I've actually had several trips uh, throughout the state of Texas. I seem to be pretty fond of Austin, um, but this is just, so. This is as far. I'm sorry. Amarillo is further west, right? Just north. Just north. Just north. Okay. So I have been there. I was my honeymoon. Believe it or not. <laughs> uh, it was a free place to stay at Paladero Canyon from some folks in Kansas City who had a cabin there, so it was interesting. I, we, I think I lasted 18 hours, and then I told my wife we have to leave. I can't take the desert anymore. <laughs> um, but it's a beautiful landscape. Uh, so again, thank you for inviting me down here. And um, I'm going, this is a lecture that, that uh, is a kind of, we do a lot of hybrids from one to the next, and much like our work, it's, it's never kind of a reinventing of the wheel, but we're sort of constantly tweaking um, what we're talking about. And my partner and I gave something very similar um, a few months ago, and, and so it, that was two of us, so it's just me today. Um, so 
Um, if I seem to trip up over some of them, it's only because it's, it's me doing it alone today. Uh, so I'll, uh, let's begin. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you kind of a, a pretty wide variety of, of projects that, that we've worked on over the course of our um, uh, history. Uh, and it kind of hopefully will allow you to sort of have some insight into where we began and, and, and where we are right now and, and hopefully where we're going. And, and maybe it helps inform, it, 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 it'll help inform you as to maybe some potential paths that you may want to take. I think, as just as Peter said, we do a wide variety of work, so really you can kind of, most practices around the country will probably stick in a particular zone. And so as you think about where you're going to go, obviously you need to consider that as, as a possibility that you will probably be either in a place where you get to do a wide variety of things or, or you, you know, don't perceive it as being stuck doing one thing, but just know that there's the chance that there's a, a type of practice will only serve a certain scale of work. And, and uh, that's something that we, we at Eldorado have um, always strive to have a variety of, of, of options. Um, <clears throat> You know, the, the notion of, of, of a shop, um, I think, is at its root um, inherent to both this region and, and where we're from um, in that, you know, it, it's, it's a very, um, it has been or it was a pioneering uh, part of the landscape when it was first uh, um, uh, landed by the, the uh, um, settlers. And it, at, at its core, everyone was forced to do everything from scratch, create everything. Nothing was ready-made. Um, you couldn't order it from any place. So this idea of actually figuring out a problem, identifying the problem and figuring out a solution and, and coming up with a, a way to sort of make it um, is inherent to, to who we are. And, um, while we have evolved, obviously, as a society and a culture, um, that, that remains true to us. Uh, this, is, this is Kansas City. Uh, the, the little red dot represents where we're located within, within the city of Kansas City. Um, and it's, the, uh, it's become known as the local arts district uh, for, for our area. Um, we have a, a really strong art community in Kansas City and it's, it's been very dear to us as we sort of developed our practice. Uh, this is our, this is our uh, building. We actually bought and renovated our own building a few years ago. Um, it's a modest 1950s pole barn that was kind of infilled with CMU block and when we tried to put new windows in the building the structural engineer said nope you can't put any new windows in the building because it can't handle it. So we were left with just five or six openings, uh, so natural light was really not an option, but we figured out a way around that. Um, more importantly, uh, this facility and this building really had to serve um, uh, two purposes. One uh, was for our uh, studio itself, but then beyond that, uh, an extension of that being our, our, our fabrication shop and being able to sort of house both of those parts of our uh, practice in one uh, where it was where it could be seamless uh, so this is a just a snapshot of me and my partners uh, there's four of us uh, who of, of those of those four two of us were founding partners um, and have we've been together for about 17 years now and uh, at the beginning we didn't necessarily select a material because it's the only material we wanted to work in. We selected a material to work with because it was most, we were fascinated by it. And, and, and it was probably one of the more versatile materials that, that we could use in our profession. Um, and so it, it, it just be kind of became this, this thing that, that we sort of went after. And we wanted to really understand it. Um, and I think most architects, that's, that's who we are. We, we, we really want to understand something before we really dig into it and try to c 
come up with a solution or design something. But to us, it's 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 understanding where where that comes from as a natural resource, is how you extract it from the earth, and then once you once you pull it out of the ground in this in this case, how you process it, how you melt it down and purify it so that you can then form it into um, shapes and pieces that, that we as architects can then use uh, as part of the, the, the framework of, of the buildings or, or houses or shelters that we design. Um, and so just to kind of go through some of this is that, in, and some people know this, some people don't know this, but almost all steel shapes begin as a flat piece of plate and then they are either rolled, bent, and then seamed together uh, in a variety of forms. And this can be really important when you sort of really begin to leverage these pieces. And this is where I would really like my partner to be here because I really can't remember why this slide's in here. <laughs> there's, a, and there's an amazing reason. This is part of our <coughs> comic relief. <laughs> and this is the transition piece, which I have no idea what it is. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, so, there, we actually, we're, we're fortunate in Kansas City to have a, 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 steel, fabric, a steel mill uh, where it actually receives uh, flat rolls uh, in their yard. Uh, it's called XL Tube. And they bring it into their warehouse. They come strapped in these massive coils that just weigh tons and tons. Uh, and they obviously move it around their shop. They put it onto specific machines that are then designed to pull those flat plates out, run them through a purifying process and a, and a, and a, almost like a, a decoiling of the material itself. And then that piece is is going to run through a series of machines over and over again, heated, cooled, um, and then laser cut uh, into the specific piece, uh, shapes so that then they can then be kind of rolled and formed into tubes uh, or angles or whatever the, whatever the shape is that's desired. <clears throat> and oh, here's a video. Is the audio working? There's an amazing noise to this if it was working. It's okay. We took a tour of the facility. We, we brought our entire shop um, down there to see it, but it's, it's fairly automated. Um, but to actually see these kind of pieces just kind of move through the entire assembly line is amazing. And you can kind of see them being dumped on in the in the light, in the lower ground. So what this what this means to us is is really um, I, uh, Chris brought me out to the Bruno House um, out on the out by the what was it Ransom, Ransom Canyon, Canyon. Um, and it, I mean in, in in a similar fashion it. it I think um, Bruno really tried to understand the material that he was working with and like constantly kind of you know shape this thing into what it is today. But for us, it, it's you know how you put these pieces together is really important. Every it's, it's the tectonics of, of, of the structure that you're making, and, and you know whether it be a, a table frame such as this is that you know the expression of, of how you put these things together is really important, and that we we have no desire to hide them in any fashion. Um, so they're strategically. Uh, design so that the connections can be expressed accordingly and then how they end up in their final form uh, after all the finishing uh, still those connections kind of show through um, and it's it's those details that that we built along the way um, a variety of them being anything from uh, these kind of bent bent rod pieces to form legs of a stool that we designed or an adjustable foot piece that went onto a, a custom conference table, or even looking at specific hinging mechanisms that informed a light that we designed. Uh, all of these things 
we've accumulated this library of details that we employ on a repetitive basis, but it, it seems like every time we do it, we find one little thing that we can kind of tweak. Again, it's, it's a wheel. You don't reshape a wheel. You take a wheel and you find better ways to make that wheel. And that's really kind of what we're doing. And some examples of, of, of our, in this case, we have a, a, a series of handrails. Um, we get pretty knowledgeable about the variety of shapes and splices that need to um, make up a, a handrail, for instance. Um, we develop uh, specific shop drawings. Uh, these are stock details that we have, and they can be applied to a variety of, of scenarios. Um, this is, shows you a particular portion of a handrail and all of its pieces. So the pieces are cut, they are prepared at each ends for welding, um, all the holes are drilled uh, ahead of time, and then it goes through a series of processes. In this case, what you're seeing here is there are holes drilled into a larger size tube that are used for plug welds, which is the middle, middle picture, and then finally those plug welds are ground smooth. So we're not purists. In some cases we believe things should be ground, in other cases it shouldn't be. It depends on what the piece is. Given that this is a handrail, it should be smooth and pleasant to the touch, not to mention ADA requirements. <laughs> uh, tools, vice grips, uh, clamps, you know, all the things that I think at some point in our childhood or where they're messing around in dad's garage or whatever it is, but you know, these things all have come to fruition for us. You know, it's just, it's fun to have all this stuff readily available and accessible to us because we can employ them at any given moment. <clears throat> Discovering a whole bunch of new tools as well um, that help shape, form pieces that we make. Uh, you know, tools used to hold steel in place while you're actually welding. One of the most interesting things about welding when we first learned is what it does when you heat metal, how it begins to deform wildly. Um, so there's a real art form to clamping it down in a certain way that by the time you're done welding, it doesn't end up ending up like a bad hair day when you wake up in the morning. Um, so, you know, these are just making sure everything's at right angles um, and the right dimensions and, and portions to each other and then the finished product of, of what, what it looks like before we end up finishing it. And, you know, there's, again, a myriad of, of examples of, of how this can be applied and we've it's, it's the small stuff. So the big picture often looks different. The small details often is where you'll find a lot of consistency in what we do. Um, but there's always some iteration of that. <clears throat> so with that, um, I'll start uh, getting into a few projects. And um, uh, one of the first comprehensive design build projects that we had an opportunity to, to um, exercise our design build demons, I should say. Um, the AIA uh, actually gave us the chance in Nora in uh, 2010 for anyone. Was anyone at the convention here at all? No? Okay, so you didn't really get to experience this. They put a couple rules on us. Uh, they wanted us to organize this main artery of the convention hall. If anyone's ever been to a convention, it's it's horrible, even an architect's convention, because it's nothing but 500 vendors wanting you to sell shit. And you have to find some, find, somehow find a way to organize and make some part of this experience pleasant. So Hanley Wood, who is the publisher of, of Architect Magazine, hired us to design a, an avenue uh, within the convention hall uh, and we decided that we were going to look at each section of this spine in a couple different ways and serve a few different functions so that the architects could have some relief from the vendors, um, be it a cafe or a theater or a photo booth um, or an internet cafe. We sort of identified each of these zones and, and these colors as a diagram first. And what we did is we decided to 
employ um, two very basic materials uh, that could be, upon the closing of the convention, could be dismantled and reused in some capacity. And I'll, and I'll get to what that is in, this, uh, in a few slides, but we decided to go ahead and employ uh, uh, nothing but more than two by four, OSB plywood, um, and just plate steel. And the reason for that is that it was a, a very simple method of, of construction that we could <coughs> handle within our own facility and then actually ship it down to New Orleans and erect it in a matter of hours. Um, there was very little time between the time we arrived there and when we got back. Um, now, why we chose these materials is because we have a strong relationship with uh, Tulane's urban build program. And every year they build a house and the constraint we gave ourselves uh, beyond the materials was that we couldn't cut any of the two by fours or any of the OSB, that it had to remain in its, in its nominal dimension uh, so, so that the urban build program could take all the pieces and actually leverage it towards a house uh, in the following year. Um, so that's essentially what we did. Um, and then we had to, we didn't realize how much um, room this was going to take up. I had to call in a favor to a client of mine who happened to have a warehouse. So we made everything and then made several trips to ship it to there. Um, and these, this is an image of us actually before the conventions getting started um, erecting the, the, vertical, the vertical sign pieces along the avenue. You can see there are absolutely no vendors in here whatsoever. Uh, and then at the end of the day, all the vendors come in and they kind of clog up this, this space. But these pieces were meant to identify where you were in the convention hall. And then after the convention, the demobilization, the storage, and then the repurposing of it. Uh, and here's the, an image of the students actually putting it to use. Uh, it's kind of a fun image actually because all the um, slightly Soviet era icon. The, we didn't design the icons, by the way. I don't know where that came from. Um, but you know, it's all part of the, the bones of the building, so you don't really see it in the end, but the, the process is kind of fun to watch. So we build and we install. Um, we also work with artists quite a bit. Uh, and I'm going to show you a project of how our how our, our practice really enjoys removing ourselves from the world of architecture sometimes and the world of, of total pragmatism to um, the world of an artist, which actually can be very liberating at times. And, and this was a, a rooftop uh, space on a garage in downtown Kansas City where a 1% for art commission was given to a local artist. Uh, and her idea was to actually um, utilize the space as a, as a platform for recollecting the history of Kansas City. We used to have a, an immense um, rail yard for cattle uh, movement. Uh, everything from Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, and, and Missouri would come through Kansas City and then get shipped out. The cattle was processed and shipped out. And so the rail the rail um, is a, a significant part of our history, and, and her, her idea was to sort of basically install this rail car on the top of the roof and um, for it to also serve as not just a, 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 an icon or a symbol of our history, um, but also to be a, a place of performance and, and reflection. Um, and so here, <laughs> we actually, we're thinking initially that she she wanted to have a, an existing rail car hoisted up under the roof and 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 put up there. So that unfortunately um, we discovered that an actual rail car was too heavy for the roof to handle. So we had to fabricate one out of a slightly lighter gauge so that actually could, so the roof could handle it. And so these are just a few images of the frame and, and it being hoisted up. Um, we were able to use real rails. Um, but this is, this is really, and so here, here you kind of see how uh, in the daytime the, the, the envelope of the car is very opaque, but then at night as the lights illuminate the interior, it really becomes very transparent. And this is just a scene of, of um, 
uh, some musicians actually occupying the space and, and performing a, a little a little song for a group of people. Um, but this is essentially what it was intended to do. And really, I mean, there's no there's no practical function from an architect's point of view, but it, it's it just allows us to kind of step outside of our normal world once in a while and uh, apply our, our knowledge and our experience in a different way. Um, another another example of this uh, would be the another project by the city of Kansas City, which is called the, the Front Street Markers, which is a a very industrial part of town that uh, the city wanted to identify this as a as a as a point of entry into um, this industrial zone. And and what we what we did is we this is the intersection prior to the installation and then the intersection post installation and we erected these series of, of marking devices uh, that um, were positioned right at the, the kind of point of entry and what they basically are is they're a, they're a, a series of perforated panels kind of wrapped around a structure and then they're they're lit from within and all that energy is actually supplied uh, by a series of solar panels that are located on the, the perforated panels themselves. So it's, it's, it doesn't require any outside energy. Um, and whatever energy we get during the day is what allows the, the pieces to be illuminated at night. And so if we don't get anything, it's not lit. Um, but you see anything in the background? We wanted it to be this kind of juxtaposition to this coal fire plant that sits in the background. And so these pieces kind of are intended to be just like that, only obviously it doesn't require any, any fossil fuels to be kind of used. And so you can kind of see here in the getting into some of the, the closer ups is that here's the, the inversion system. And, and one thing, I, I don't know if, if Texas has, but in, in, in Missouri we have a, a, a great agreement with the power companies that we can leverage federal state grants and the power company is also required to pay back any solar power that's generated and uh, that can be put back into the grid so there's this there's no storage necessarily it's just simply sold back into the grid um, but even you know in this in this case it's still the same thing it's it's a it's a careful detailing of the pieces and components these are simple four by eight sheets uh, standard stock pieces. We didn't do anything to these. They're just simply rolled into the shape. So the size of the sheet dictated the diameter. We did nothing more than that. So a lot of this is based on economics and sticking with budgets. Um, material is never the most expensive part. It's the fabrication of all the pieces. It's labor. So knowing when to do things and when not to do things is really important. Uh, Peter mentioned teaching. Um, we uh, were asked by Kansas State University to head up their design build program about three years ago to actually mark a point in time where they were committing to an official program that they would sustain throughout um, or into the future. Uh, and they asked us if we would head it up, uh, not expecting us to necessarily carry it on until the day we decide to retire, but it's kind of turning out that way, um, which is fine. Um, it's been a fun exercise uh, in, in doing so, and, and what we're basically working with is, is, is fifth year master's degree students who um, are then matched up with a real client uh, from the community. In this case, this project is the, the local council of the Girl Scouts, um, who we bring uh, a project that would ordinarily not have enough funding to really have a architectural fee supported and a general contractor supported. Um, so we saw this as a unique situation where we could kind of bring a pretty low budget that none of us would really want to be able to touch anyway because we would lose ridiculous amounts of money on on both sides, contractor and architect, um, and actually leverage the students um, at their best. And um, this is a, a shower and bathing facility as well as a series, as a cabin prototype uh, for the Girl Scouts at this camp. So this is about 40 minutes from the campus. 
And the funny thing about Design Build Studios is that, you know, as, as students, you want to get in and you want to start making things right away. Well, it's no different from any other project. You have to, you have to do the planning, you have to do the programming, you have to do all the upfront design work. Um, and so we, make, we take them through the process. So the fall semester is really about all of the th traditional things that architects do. And then the spring semester is where we launch into the actual construction. Now, in this particular case, they designed the entire thing, uh, both the shell of the structure as well as the, the shower pods. Um, however, we, this project actually spanned over about two to three years because we kind of got ourselves in a pickle with the first year. They couldn't quite actually get to the build part, um, which was a good learning experience for us, um, and I think for them too. Uh, it's just knowing, knowing where your boundaries are, what your capacity is. Uh, so this really spanned over the course of two years, and we actually employed a local contractor to do parts and pieces of it, and then used the students where it made sense, and really didn't try to go beyond their means. And they had a, they had a blast. Um, <clears throat> they enjoyed every part of it um, at the end. Uh, and they, they were able to you know, explore things they couldn't have done in, in a traditional setting. Um, they got into steel fabrication. They got into working with polycarbonates and acrylics. They got into working with plumbing, wood, and they couldn't find the right shower enclosure, so they actually sewed their own curtains for the, for the, for the facilities themselves, which was amazing, you know. Um, so really employed all, all aspects of, of, of a project. And, you know, they came up with wonderful solutions of, you know, where, where the girls put their clothes while they're having a shower. Well, it's off-the-shelf wire baskets. You don't have to make everything. You can employ a lot of ready-made products that are probably found in your local hardware store um, or storage container store. Um, and then, you know, the, the finished product, and they, you know, they detailed everything. And, and that's kind of a final image of it, of it actually working just as, as, as envisioned. So now I'm going to shift a little bit to um, some of our, our light manufacturing, as we call it. In this case, it's manufacturing alcohol, which we still enjoy. Uh, we have a great brewery in Kansas City, which unfortunately, or fortunately, just got sold to um, Belgium company, some of you may know them, Duval. Um, so, and it, it sold for a hundred million dollars. Yeah, we've all thought about starting to make beer here lately. <laughs> <laughs> but the unique thing about the owner of this company is that he's been expanding this, this brewery ever since we started our practice. So in the same time frame, and, and I remember when he came out with his second beer, and it's a, it was a pale ale, and I, it's the only beer that I still drink anymore because it's, it's just it's so well crafted, and he put so much passion behind it. And it's not because it's a local beer because I, I don't subscribe to that local versus national regional. It's just he makes an amazing beer, um, and he gave us this opportunity to expand his facility, um, specifically eight tanks for a, a seasonal beer that, that, that they make. Um, and in the initial stages of the project, um, the, the idea was to use an existing structure and pop up through the roof. Um, it was a, a being used as a, as a tasting room, an entertainment room, and they really needed to expand <coughs> further. Well, in the design process, in the surveying process, we discovered there was an underground river um, running right beneath the building. So that changed the box into a slightly angled, uh, cut the kind of northern end of it off a little bit, which these are the happy accidents we enjoy. This is what makes the project unique now. Um, if, it would, if it had been that, I don't think the project would be the same today. But reacting to that constraint is what makes this, this process fun. Uh, and, it, and it also just so happens to be the north side of the building. So we um, took advantage of some of those that I'll get to. But this is kind of a, a floor plan showing you where the eight tanks are 
Uh, and this is the outline of the building right here that actually pops up through the roof and everything else is existing. And these are the eight tanks that, that are kind of, um, that, that were installed. And this is the upper floor plan that shows you the stair leading up to it. And so these are where all the, the brew masters come up uh, to the top along this catwalk and, um, you know, move through their process. And this is a section through here just kind of showing you this is the existing building and then this really fascinating kind of space that's created because of this purely out of the, the necessity to keep, the, you'll, you'll notice in some of those images some of the tanks were outside, some were inside, so it all depended on the type of beer they're actually crafting. In this case it had to be insulated. Um, and it, after getting into it we were um, kind of reminded of a particular project in Arkansas that some of you may know. Um, it had some very odd kind of similarities. Um, one of the things that we did is, is you know, you, you, cut, you, you go through this, you, you figure out all the pragmatics, um, but then you have to kind of figure out, well, what are we going to do with the, the envelope of the building? Uh, and in this case, we knew we had a northern, uh, a true north elevation, because this sits on a, a street that actually runs kind of in a southwesterly uh, direction, and we had to protect the envelope of the building um, from the, the solar path, uh, but then expose it where we could. And so what you have is you have a, a consistent uh, solar screen that runs along the east, south, and west edge, and then we basically expose the entire front end of the building uh, that faces north. And, and really what you, what you end up with is something pretty amazing. Um, but it's also the process in which I, and how we got there. Um, we're working within side of a building. Uh, so, the actual excavation for the foundations all took place inside of a building. We actually kept the roof of the building on during the excavation. Um, we dug all the way down. Of course, naturally, we discovered a myriad of piping systems that they didn't tell us about, which fortunately they were good about rolling with that cha particular change order. Um, and then, you know, Kind of, the, these might seem mundane, but, but it, there was a, a real art form to kind of doing this surgical foundations. I mean, it's a, it was a surgical procedure, if you can think about it that way, but establishing sort of certain particular parts of the, the foundation system. But in this case, we had to do a, a three foot deep, four foot deep mat foundation. And this little uh, element that you see here in the center is actual, will actually end up being the trough for the floor uh, of, the, of the facility. And that had to be completely protected while these kind of layers and layers of, of steel reinforcing were, were kind of sleeved onto that system. And then pop a quick hole in the roof and then move the concrete into the space. And here are the guys kind of pouring four foot thick of, of concrete all the way down through all this steel. And, and uh, obviously having to aerate it constantly to make sure there weren't any, any bubbles in it. Um, and then the finished product uh, is, is this, so it's, it's, it's a lot of work to get to this point, but pretty rewarding when you get there. And then, you know, then we take the roof off, uh, we start looking at um, the actual footings and plate systems for the columns that would then allow the structure to exist. Actually, I'm sorry, this is the, you're seeing two sets of, of footing plate systems here. The bigger ones are for the actual structure of the building, the smaller ones are just for the tanks themselves and the steel frame kind of being le lowered into place. Um, the other part about construction is you get to figure out where you put your heavy equipment, where are the erectors, the erector um, crane's gonna be put, and you're limited by the street, which is one of the main arteries. Um, there's a radius to which it can go, so we had to find the right spot for the truck to be. Once that was determined, they're all kind of put in place, and then the tanks are put in place and lowered into position. And then finally the roof of the building is put on after the tanks are in place. And then this is a, the, the solar system that we did, that we used is actually, we worked it out with the glazing company um, where it's, a, it's an all, it's a curtain wall system with butt glazed glass and then at the butt glazing are just a series of knife uh, 
support systems for the solar screens. And then once those are on, we chose a, uh, a perforated corrugated metal and all those pieces are applied directly to those flange, flanges. And in the end, this is kind of what you get. So, you know, it, you have, again, two different, two different sides um, of the building, one during the daytime and one at night. And this is exactly what we were going for, is that um, the owner wanted to kind of showcase this piece of the, the facility. And, and at night, he agreed to keep the lights on um, all night long, uh, because in the end, um, at least some, some images of just some details. We were fortunate that we were working with a, a, a subcontractor who could actually cut the corrugations at a 45 degree angle and, and fitted them up perfectly. Um, that doesn't happen on every one of our projects, but it was certainly fun to get that done on this one. And then you can kind of see here some, the difference between daytime and evening and how transparent that, that envelope becomes. And this is where, kind of where it gets a little fun, and, and I'll make that reference back to the Thorn Crown Chapel. Um, but you know, this is what you see when you're siding down the tanks, and the catwalk and the stairs. But then you see this image like looking up, and it, it's, it's almost cathedral-like. Um, and it, you know, I grew up Catholic, so it's not really a big issue. You drink all the time. <laughs> um, and this is, you know, it's in a mess of stuff, but it's okay, you know, so it's a little, it's kind of a little refined piece within the overall thing. And then finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> leveraging that experience into a, a, a slightly bigger scale of design build. And this was a, an office building that we had custom designed for a specific tenant. So we're working with a developer, we're working with an anchor tenant, and they were, um, uh, a tech company that services a lot of universities uh, uh, for their alumni. They, they, they've developed a software system for, alum, for alumni uh, to reach out and manage their accounts and fundraising operations. It's a successful business, um, but as usually what happens in the suburbs, they just move from one building to the next, and so they're just kind of moving around. They're looking at all these different buildings, and, and, and fortunately, we were able to convince them to, to actually build a new building and, and be specific with what they, they want. Uh, these are the types of buildings that were surrounding our project. They're lovely. Um, and in the particular case, uh, this was the building that was there, uh, this wonderful French Mansart something suburban thing. Uh, more of the same. And so the developer chose to take, it was kind of an aging structure, it wasn't really suitable for contemporary office use, so he at least had the foresight to just take it down and start over. And so we took the existing building, uh, removed it, and due to zoning constraints, we actually had to reduce the square footage from the original building. Um, but we were able to get all of the program into the same building and actually create this really simple um, shell for the tenant. And it's, 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 it's really straightforward in that there's a, you know, it's, you might look at a 50 million office building floor plans and they're all the same. There's a core in the middle, there's bathrooms, there's staircases, and there's offices at some parts and around the perimeter, but it's, it's what you do with that. It's, what, it's how you craft those spaces. It's how you craft the envelope of the building, and it's how the building functions for those people. Um, and we really wanted to focus on this really clear and, and pure idea, which is that we have an office building, we have a core. Natural light was really important to them. They were moving from a very dark suburban building to a place where they wanted it to feel like a very raw, well-lit space. Um, that would manage the, the, the sun in an appropriate way. And so we chose a, a slightly different perforated screening system to protect the building. And they're made up of a series of vertical panels. Um, on the south side, it's mostly flat and protects the entire face of the building. And then on the east and west, they are a series of vertical louvers that are actually slightly angled towards the north. And then 
because of city ordinance rules that you can't have an elevation that is the same for any 75 to 100 feet, we had to find a way to change the elevation in a way that didn't erode or water down our idea. So we just chose to rearrange the interior of the program so that offices were, had the dense pattern and that the more common public spaces could allow the louvers to open up a little bit because people weren't in there all day long. And so that gave us this kind of, this flexibility to sort of just make this slight shift. And then on the other side, this is the exit stair. So we just kind of opened it up. Naturally, the owner came back once it was done and said, oh my God, it's so hot in there. It's an exit stair. Don't hang out in the exit stair. The north face of the building, uh, again, this rule applied where the city said, and you can't have, we'd say that we didn't need, we need any louvers on the north side. Um, and they said, well, you can't have an elevation of 200 feet of the same material or articulation. So we positioned two offices at each corner, and then we took straight 90 degree louvers and we just kind of positioned them, assuming that really with the solar path, even in the sharpest contrast of the morning and the sharpest contrast of the evening, you do get a slight angle coming in at that edge. So at least we were able to kind of rationalize that move and we didn't feel bad about ourselves. Um, so this is where you begin. It starts with a concrete building. It's glazed. We came up with a solar system that was able to kind of wrap the entire building and then that's kind of dropped in place. And it's basically Again, these pieces right here, these are only two feet long. Now they have two breaks in them. There's a 90 degree break or a, a 40, uh, 39 degree break here and another 39 degree break here. And those two breaks really help the ends of the panels become rigid. So the, one of the things about working with plate steel is that it's folding. Like take a piece of paper and the more you fold it, the stronger it becomes. It's just that simple. Um, and due to the, the financial constraints, we had to make sure that that complete break happened within 24 inches and that we could actually use a four by eight sheet, break it in half and use two panels out of it. So there's virtually no waste in this system whatsoever. And then on the flat side, the same thing, even though it's, we just had to, keep a really rigid 24 inch on center uh, support system and then just break them at a 90 degrees so they could attach to it in that fashion. So obviously protecting the building here starts to shield it on all sides. And then these are some of the renderings that we had put together to help communicate to the city what we were doing. And I'm also showing these because the, the images that we have don't have the landscaping in its kind of fullest form. Um, so, but this is the intent of, of the project when the landscaping comes into its mature stage. So that was the building. Um, the uh, fire department, um, called us right before we took the building down and said, could we use it as a, uh, could they use it as a, as a training ground? Um, you can imagine all the legal papers that had to be signed for that to occur. Um, but they did, and so they, they had their fun with it, um, which obviously developed, we developed a good relationship with the fire department. I mean, it, it's one of these parts of town that never sees a fire. It's the richest of all suburbs and they are bored. The firemen are just bored out of their minds. <laughs> Uh, so they practiced, we finally tore it down, <coughs> um, excavation, the entire uh, footing of the old building had to be removed, uh, the soil had to be compacted to the appropriate strength, uh, and then the, um, the aggregate laid uh, for the future foundations to occur, and then you can see the, the footing starting to go in at this point here. Um, At this point, we have had the columns are poured and curing, and then the, the first floor slab goes down, and then the shoring begins for the second floor up there. 
Um, all the, I should mention that all of the data and communication systems and electrical was all um, pre-planned in the slab, so everything's laid out. There's no exposed uh, wiring in the building. So all that had to be coordinated uh, with all the steel reinforcing. And you can kind of see here a series of iterations of the concrete structure itself. Um, another component to handling the whole process means that when you move from one season to the next, you're, you're dealt cards that you don't necessarily like. You plan for it, but you don't like them. Uh, we had to wrap the entire building in a temporary uh, plastic sheeting with temporary walls. Um, this happened in two, the, the spring of 2012, and I don't know what your weather was like, but we had snow in May. Wreaked havoc on our, on our schedule. Yeah, this is May, right here. So these are the, some uh, uh, progress shots of the building going up here. And this is the, these are the interior spaces as they kind of near completion. And so this face is um, north right here. You can kind of see this space has no glazing on it. And here, you know, we're not actually fabricating all the steel work in this case. Um, the schedule is so aggressive. Uh, that we chose to actually sub it out to some other steel fabricators, but we employed the same principles and the same detailing techniques. And it allows us to speak with fabricators in a really intelligent way. And then you can see here sort of the move in. Uh, these images are sort of the brackets that are being installed on the south side prior to the perforated panels going on. And then you can kind of see uh, the south side, all the, all the panels going on. So they marched all these things down kind of in a linear fashion. And then here you can kind of see as the, this is the south side and this is the west. And this is that break where the stair happens. And this is another kind of unique opportunity at the corner here. So we move from these flat panels to these angled vertical pieces. And the big question, a big question came up because we had to send this past the corner of the building a bit to protect it from the, from the solar path. And you know, we just kind of came up with this little, really simple, straightforward kicker plate. And that's all it is. And it's, some of this is not being afraid of someone saying, oh, that, that's kind of dumb. Yeah. Yeah, dumb is good sometimes. Don't, don't overthink it all the time. It's just fine. In the grand scheme of things, it's just a kind of a one little unique detail. Um, this is the entry canopy that kind of stops the perforations because there's, there's horizontal pieces that actually go on, or they're on top of here protecting all of this. And this is a view of the northwest corner so you can kind of see how those angled panels come to this point and then they switch to these vertical pieces and then you have the entire north face which is actually completely exposed since it doesn't have to worry about the sun. And these are just these related. And that's the complete elevation. So as you can see, the, the landscaping is obviously not in full bloom yet, but it'll get there. This is an image of the west and then of the south. And I really like what it does at night. It's very similar to the brewery that it, it really, you know, in the daytime it has, it has a certain presence, but then at night um, it, it really becomes this really beautiful transparent box. Um, and you can, you can start to see the, the kind of people working, especially in the winter time as the, as the, at the, as the end of the day nears. Oop, didn't mean to do that. I'm happy to take any questions at all or discuss anything. If you want to have a dialogue about anything, I'd love to talk more. There are no stupid questions. I have a question. Okay. It's probably stupid. It's okay. Um, within your firm, so kind of your intense focus on steel from the beginning, does that mean that even today do you focus on your making or what you offer the budget? It's just the steel fabrication? Or does your company still do the pouring of the concrete and the laying of the rebar interior partitions in that? So our, our shop really is only a steel shop. 
we, we, we don't do anything else. We haven't from day one, and we still don't. We still don't do anything else but steel. We, we chose to just focus on one thing and do one thing really well. And then everything else, everything else is subcontracted out. There's always the, there's the shock at first. And it's kind of an oh shit moment. And then you're trying to figure out all the different ways you're going to tell your client that you just discovered this unforeseen condition. Um, and then over the course of 18 years, um, you, you get comfortable with the fact that when you're dealing with renovations and existing urban lots, I mean, this stuff happens and there's just nothing you can do to control it. And as upset as, a, as an owner or client might get, because it's going to force some difficult decisions, um, you have to broach them with it immediately. You can't wait. And you can't labor over it. Um, what we usually do is we try to not just present the problem, prepare a series of solutions or a solution. We tend to not give our clients options. We tell them, we give them one strong recommendation, and that's it. It's like, if we can't come up with one good recommendation, then we're not really doing our job. So it's really important that we understand what those unforeseen issues are, how we can either mitigate it or come up with some, a solution that it allows the conversation to go through all the emotional steps it needs to and then get back to being logical and methodical and coming up with a, a path forward. Are y'all already into the construction process when you found the river, or was it prior when y'all were just in the design? Fortunately, that was in that particular case was in the design phase. Have you ever gotten into a construction process and then found a unforeseen problem like that? All the time. How did you? <laughs> do you have an example? Um. Oh, well, there was an exa there was another design build project which I didn't include in this that was being done at the same time as, as this one, um, and it was a building renovation. And we thought that the sanitary it was a very tight lot, only 25 feet wide, and then it had another 25 two buildings on either side of it. And we thought that the sewer lines were I mean most buildings have their own sewer lines. Well, no, it actually went out of our building into the neighbor's building and then out to the alleyway. The problem with that is that that was a condo. And this was an office building. And having your excrement flow into someone else's property and then into the street conjured up all kinds of nightmare scenarios <laughs> in the future. So we had to, <laughs> we tried to figure out a way to work with them and they became incredibly difficult, just as I sort of predicted would happen. It's a condo association. And so we ended up having to excavate inside the building all the way to the alley. And that, and that sewer line was 16 feet beneath the alley. So you can imagine a trench going 120 feet from the front of our building through the first floor at an angle before it reaches the sanitary sewer in the, in the alley. It's a $60,000 expense that we weren't anticipating. But it's one of those unforeseen conditions that, you know, any contractor would, it's, it's not their, it's no one's fault. It's just you, you come across these things. You do your best to scope it. Somehow the scoping mechanism didn't go down the right path and it went off in a different direction. Oops. That's the best way to just, it's kind of an oops moment. But again, in that scenario, we had, since that was a little trickier, we did have like two or three options available. So we had one, talk to the condo association, see if we can work something out. Two, come prepared with advice for excavating and putting a sanitary line in. And then three, 
trying to get the city to agree to allow us to cross property lines and, and not let the Cond Association be in control of the situation to the degree that they were trying to position themselves in. So they will ask them. I'll just start picking on someone here. So, uh, uh, thank you for the, the overview. I really appreciated all of the, the that we weren't just looking at pictures of final products. We took us through the process and the product and the, through the fabrication process. Um, and I also appreciate very much the, the front end on investigative material and, and material logic and what that taught you about design. The thing that I'm uh, missing, the next chapter of the lecture, but I'm curious, I don't know whether it all has to happen in the next 27 minutes, but um, is to, to talk, I imagine that your design process, both in terms of the structure of the partnership, but not, it's not a single person, mm -hmm. uh, but also just given that this intense material knowledge that's, uh, that goes from inception to finished product is pretty unique. It's not a typical, you're not a typical office in that way. Mm -hmm. So I'd be curious to hear you talk a little bit about the design, how a project evolves in early design stages, and whether you use a lot of models or other uh, other forms that are something unique to your office, your practice that's that comes out of this unique ex mm -hmm. expertise that you develop. Sure. Um, it. I, I. I don't. I think we've. So you know, the four partners came. Um, uh, I don't want to sound nostalgic necessarily as much as I want to root it in. When we came out of school, um, we were in that transition zone between moving from true physical model making with hands and exacto blades. There was no digital interface whatsoever, and pop, there's the model for you. Um, I'm being a little cynical here. Um, to immediately being thrust into this digital world. Um, and so the, our transition, and, and, and keep in mind we're working with parallel bars and erasers and ink pens and mylar and all that stuff, and we've had to make this complete shift from all that to cell phones, iPads, digital fabrication. So it's, uh, it feels like we've gone through this massive whirlwind, and so the result of that really is that we have a cross-section of people at our office that really span several of these generations all within that period of time. And so there's, there's both people who have had to learn everything, and then there are people who are coming out of school with knowledge and expertise that we don't have. And so we're trying to employ everybody's strengths on each project. So there's no consistency with each project as much as it's whoever the team members are, whatever their strengths are, whatever they can bring to the project. Um, we leverage those capabilities to help that project develop and evolve over the course of its lifetime. Um, so we use everything in some cases, and, and some of this is dependent on the client too. For example, residential clients, single family residential clients, they don't really like digital modeling. It, 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 you, can, you can just feel them get very nervous about it. It, it feels too finite too quickly. So you you tend to take them through sketches, loose, you have to begin loosely, and then you slowly refine it over time. We use physical models in those scenarios. And then eventually we'll get to digital renderings and that kind of thing. Um, but that's, that's kind of how we approach it from their perspective. And then other more commercial clients, we can kind of move a lot faster and actually leverage just current technology. Um, we, don't use some of the standard softwares that are out there. Um, we don't use Revit right now. We use a different system. Um, but I, I would just say that we, we just, and then um, as far as the shop goes, it also plays a role in the design process where we feel like we need to mock up certain details it's really helpful in preparing full-scale mock-ups of a corner of a house or a, a stair. That, that's where we would go beyond uh, just steel work. We will we'll often tend to just 
just do the whole mock-up ourselves. Um, handrails, guardrails, steel staircases, that kind of stuff. So we'll, we'll employ all those, we'll employ every tool at our disposal to help us make decisions in the design process. And the interesting thing about where we began and where we are today is that we're, we've almost come, we, we began where everybody had to do everything and then we started hiring more people and we grew and we grew and then we had specialty people doing certain things and but they became very role specific and then weren't as uh, flexible with what they could do and now we're coming back to this notion that as we move forward the expectation of everyone is that you are doing both you need this we it is it has allowed us to grow as architects therefore we feel it's important that you move through the same process that we went through so get your hands dirty experiment apply that knowledge and that experience to what you do on the computer or in your sketch form or in your model construction whatever the case is but vet the ideas out with everything that you have available to you. Does that answer? Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the questions don't have to be about the work, really. I mean, you can, you can, they can be broader than that, too. I mean, ask anything. Can I, I might have one more, sorry. Um, as I have a second part of time to question. I think it's really fascinating about this idea of focusing very much on one material and knowing exactly how it's going to work and fabricating it and using it. It seems like it's what allows you that flexibility of scale in many ways as a design build firm, like the pragmatics of logistics of holding that type of business. Do you, do you think that that has allowed you, and it, would that be a correct assumption, that it allows you to go super big and super small? Because design build can be really hard as a business to try to consult and you know, mitigate all of these different materials and construction process and CA is focusing only on one material allows you more, I guess, commissions or flexibility within your practice. Yeah, definitely. Um, it it just allows us to, to know what our we're very we're a very constraint based practice. Um, we use constraint. We embrace it. Um, and so knowing what your capabilities are uh, often defines how many different roles or, or minimal roles we play on the project and where we, if we're interested in, in expanding that idea on a particular project, we will, we will reserve those parts for us. I mean, just about on every single project, like th this one, as I said, we didn't do any steel fabrication. Part of it was because it was such a massive scope and we didn't have the equipment to do this. Um, we could certainly sub it out, but by the time we subbed it out and it went through all the markups and everything like that, we couldn't afford the screening system. So we made a very clear choice. It's less cost effective for us to do it. It's better for the project if we just use our expertise and work with the fabricators to get it done in the most cost-effective manner possible. And that's, I, I would say we, we do that consistently on, on every single project. I think that's important for the students to really understand because, you know, we see a lot of firms that will specialize, but they specialize in program, not material ownership. And mm -hmm. I think that's impressive. It's an interesting way to think about the profession. It, um, it seems like it can build more confidence in the work by controlling the knowledge of materials and the collection and the assembly of materials rather than the ownership of I'm the office architect or I'm the hospital architect. And, and it certainly creates a more interesting career, that's for sure. But um, I think I just wanted to point that out to be very clear for the students to hear that because, you know, they hear us talk a lot about specialized firms and maybe not so positive but a lot. But um, to specialize in material and assemblies of those materials, I think, is, makes tons of sense. Yeah, I mean, I think. I think one thing I do want to mention is that you know I, I think we're we're fascinated with every material and we want to fully investigate every one of them. I think as far as applying our actual hands-on fabrication 
expertise, we chose the specific material to deal with. Um, but as, I think, hopefully, as you can see, steel doesn't drive our projects. It just, it just becomes part of them when it makes sense to leverage it as the right, as the material that it's intended to be. You know, I mean, ultimately, it's one of the most diverse materials available to do, to do a myriad of things. It's, it's, you know, its strength to weight ratio is unmatchable other than, you know, we're going to get carbon fiber here pretty soon, so <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to outlive myself here um, pretty quickly. <clears throat> and, and we might get overlapped in the next several years. And, and I don't know if in 10 years I come back to you and we're into, we, we've switched to carbon fiber. I don't know what the future holds, but it, it's, it's, a, it's interesting for them. I don't know how many of you are in getting ready to graduate coming up, but who knows what that's going to be. It may not be steel anymore. It might be something else. I mean, I think we're moving into a whole different era of architecture um, in, in so many ways. And material, materiality is just, is just one of them. Uh, can you talk a little bit uh, more about your the design build program at the university? Kind of what that process is, um, going through the initial design phase to the final build process, and about how many students go through it, and just talk about that. Sure. Um, it's so it's a it's a fifth year master's degree studio. Um, there's about anywhere from thirteen to fifteen students every. It's a full year, so it's both semesters. It's not just one semester. Um, as I mentioned, we, we take them through two steps, basically, generally. Fall semester is, is all about the programming uh, and working with the client and, and designing the project and, and getting, as we move to the end of the semester, it's, it's fully documenting it in the form of either construction documents or in shop drawings. Because if it's, if it's furniture, for example, they would just, it's just shop drawings, they're not really doing construction documents. But we want them to go through the entire process, we want them to experience it. So we have to be really careful about scale. I showed you the one bath, bath facility that we realized very quickly impossible to do in one year. Um, so it has to be something smaller. And you hear a lot of programs out there just doing a house. Well, a house is big. It's a lot for you guys to take on in one year. It's a lot for a a normal practice to take on in a year. Most houses take six months to design and with residential contractors, 12 months to build. <laughs> I don't know why, but it does. Um, so it's, it's, it's challenging in the academic realm to really pull that off um, if you're not careful with the scale that you approach it at. So we've, fortunately we're in our fourth year now, so we, now we know, we know where the sweet spot is. Um, we, know what, we know where our parameters are with it. Um, and the, the, the ongoing challenge is really because, it's a f because you're building something, it requires real money to put into it. It's, we're not building models here, we're actually making things. So the funding of the studio has to be something that's sustainable from one year to the next. And you have to prepare for next year's studio now. You have to secure money now to prepare for what that project is going to be in that following year. So there's, um, it's, now I know why they asked us to head it up. <laughs> because I don't think, I honestly don't think the college knew, knew how to do it. Um, and given our practice, you know, we were pretty resourceful in many different ways and, and we managed to kind of put it together for them and it's been fun. It's been hard, but it's been fun. And, but I think we're finally reaching a point where we're starting to get it now and know how to sort of advise. I mean, our plan still is to not do this forever. I mean, our plan really is to get out somehow, but it does feel like the godfather in a <laughs> sense, sucking us back in. I guess we'd keep doing it because we enjoy it. I mean, that's the, our connection to academia, academia is kind of consistent throughout all of, all of, all of the partners. You know, we will each have a different vantage point. I have two partners who really enjoy the f teaching at a, at, a, at a full level. I, I enjoy small bits and pieces. <laughs> I can't do it 
all year round and you know two three times a week it's it's a little too much for me but I do enjoy a set of small touch points throughout throughout the month did that answer your question so maybe we should end on the Godfather <laughs> <laughs> who's I have I do have one quick question for us who's who's, who's getting ready to graduate who's in fifth year You're about to? Yeah. Are you worried? You're not worried? You're confident? Not worried. Good. Ready. <laughs> well, things are, I mean, things are, things are, things have picked up. So, I mean, I remember when we first started teaching, this kids were, I mean, it was their fifth year, and they were terrified. Absolutely terrified. And so we had to quickly diffuse that immediately. Um, so I had to go back to my fifth year and think about, because that was a little bit foreign to me, I mean, I, in some sense, but I also, I graduated in 93, which was the other recession. There was nothing out there when I was graduating, but I didn't worry about it. Something will come around. You'll find the right place. You'll find the right opportunity wherever it is. You just got to keep looking for it. So. That was our kind of advice to everybody, and then we just completely overloaded them with work, and they didn't even think about it. And you know what? Every single one of them had a job within a year, even at the worst possible time. And I do think, I do think that studio helped them a little bit, in part because we were also able to connect them with people, because we knew so many practitioners around the country. Um, so. Things are looking up. You guys will be fine. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.